Whoa, buddy, put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. Welcome to the party, pal. The, the Michael Dukes Show. The greed and the entitlement is astounding to me. What more could you want from a low-budget radio program? This is a dumpster fire. That was just BS. It is time to get a new perspective. We know just what you need, and we've got just the cure. Open wide and prepare for a steaming hot cup of freedom. I just don't fathom it. The Michael Dukes Show, streaming live across the world. Uh huh. Live around the world on the internet at MichaelDukesShow.com and across the state of Alaska on this, your favorite radio station and or FM translator. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to Thursday. Welcome to Thursday. Um, well, uh, I got some stuff that uh, we're going to talk about today. Um, uh, but I have to announce that unfortunately, uh, apparently I have become a problem for somebody somewhere along the lines. I had a guest that was supposed to show up on the show today and I got an email or I got a text message this morning early after I'd already started to do the prep for the show again, uh, saying that they had been asked not to come on the show. And uh, supposing that during an important time, they didn't want to jeopardize the caucus um, because of the, I don't know. that. So, so we've been apparently rabble rousing. That's part of my problem here. Apparently, uh, I must be too radical for some of the folks out there who are in leadership positions and uh, maybe I'm rocking the boat a little too much or something. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of all I can take out of this whole thing at this point is that uh, if you've been asked, you can only have been asked by the leadership of your group. And uh, that's, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a problem. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, what I had planned this morning is now changed completely and, uh, <laughs> we'll, we're good. We're going to have to, we're going to have to just make do, you know what that means? That means you guys are going to have to do some of the work. I can't do all the work this morning. I can't. I mean, I could, I could just, I could just, uh, you know, just rant for two hours. Uh, but I'll be honest with you. That's exhausting. Sometimes, uh, I, I came off the show yesterday. I was so agitated. I was so agitated yesterday and it lasted for about three and a half hours, um, <clears throat> where I just, you know, wanted to kick the cat and do everything else. What it was Anyway, um, so here we are, just you and me today. And you know what that means? Oh, yeah, that means I crack the phone lines wide open. And we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about as well. And uh, we're ready to go. We're ready to rock and roll. Um, we, uh, you know, what I've got to talk about, including some good news. I've got some good news. That's right. I've got the good news. Um, we're going to talk about that. We might talk about a little, uh, what if, uh, kind of stuff. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the tax revolt that's going on around the, the state, which I think is an important, uh, discussion. Um, let's see what good news out of the Matsu. They finally, uh, seems to have come to their senses on a little bit of, uh, stuff and things, um, in regards to businesses, uh, what else do I got? I got about, I got a whole bunch of stories. Oh, Liz Snyder. Remember, remember Liz Snyder? I mean, she was barely here for a hot second, but you remember her? Uh, yeah, she did. Uh, got a little bit of a hand slap, uh, going on there. We'll talk about that. What else was there? There was, uh, oh, the air force is now announcing new cold climate incentive pay. 
there's a, there's a couple interesting stories out there uh, to talk about. Oh, and uh, the folks out at Alaska are experiencing um, a, a crisis with a with a humpback whale, uh, which is an, it's it's a sad and interesting conundrum all at the same time. Uh, so I got a bunch of stories that we can talk about this morning. Um, but importantly, I'd love to hear what you guys are. I mean, cause I always know, you know, when I'm planning the show and I'm going through things and I'm thinking, well, I think this is interesting and I think this is important. And I, you know, I, 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 it's all about me. What do I think is working? But sometimes, you know, you guys may be thinking something totally different is important. And something that we should be talking about. And, you know, you're shaking your fist at the radio and are like, Dukes, we should be talking about this. Well, yeah. Um, I, hey, I'm, I'm, I agree. So feel free to engage this morning and just chat about <clears throat> whatever your burning topic is um, that you've been wanting to crack open and discuss um, uh, or something that just really frosts your cookies. I mean, whatever it is, 907 for, <clears throat> excuse me, 907-433-3150, 907-433-3150. If you would like to, uh, jump on board and be part of the conversation, well, I would, I would welcome that with open arms, welcome it with open arms, um, okay. What are some, what are some, what are some of the quickies here? Uh, the biggest quickie, I guess, is that the, it's kind of official here that the runoff, uh, for the Anchorage election, um, is going to be, um, between Dave Bronson and Susan LaFrance. Um, it could take weeks to figure out the, the overall numbers, uh, but they're going to be doing a runoff because uh, it looks like they have to get um, they have to get a plurality of the votes, meaning over fifty percent of uh, no uh, uh, over forty five percent. Sorry, fifty uh, percent would be a majority. Plurality is forty five percent. But as of Tuesday night, they were separated by one point. LaFrance was at thirty six percent. Bronson was at thirty five. It's not enough to declare a, victor, a winner either way because they've got to reach 45. So they're going to be a um, so there, there's going to be there's going to be more coming out. But it looks like as it's shaping up right now that it's going to be La France and um, La France and uh, Bronson between the two. So and, you know, and we knew that there's probably this was probably going to happen because you had three basically progressive candidates, and then Dave Bronson, who represents the conservative segment. But it also spells some problems because, ostensibly, anybody that voted for Chris Tuck or Bill Pop could now throw their weight behind LaFrance, and it's a question of uh, whether or not we can get more conservative voices out in the Anchorage area for that. Uh, but again, I don't have to live there. I just have to work there. It's hard enough when you have to to work there. <clears throat> I can't imagine having to live there. That would be no, no bueno for me. No bueno for me. Um, I was just going to go to the phones. I had a phone call and they just hung up. So I'm I, I, weak sauce, folks. Weak sauce. Um, let's talk for a minute about that. Uh, let's talk for a minute about this because this is sad. I've seen this before. And it's something that I will never forget. Um, and uh, I'm glad that somebody at least is uh, working on it. Uh, an entangled whale has commanded the attention of the small community of Unalaska, uh, where they're probably listening right now on one of our varied FM translators out there in the, uh, uh, in the Aleutian chain. Uh, NOAA, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, was first alerted to a distressed humpback whale in the uh, Ilu I knew I was going to mess this up. Iliuic, 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 Somebody's going to pronounce, uh, catch me on that pronunciation. It's a bay in on Alaska. Um, apparently, the whale is entangled. There's no information on what exactly is entangling the whale, but the Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Network said Wednesday that it's currently working on disentanglement efforts. 
There are two Noah Whale entanglement experts who are scheduled to touch down today. I didn't know that was a job, but apparently it is. According to the uh, Department of Fish and Game, they used a GoPro camera on a long pole to gather underwater footage to help the response team come up with a plan. Uh, they said that the entanglement goes through the mouth and then back around the tail. So the whale is essentially hogtied. Um, they said it's able to, uh, it appears to be in really good condition. It's able to breathe regularly, but it's very likely stressed. And then when entangled whales, especially when they're very stressed, they can be unpredictable and dangerous. So they're asking the public to stay at least a hundred yards away from the whale, but it is located close to shore where it's, you know, in stress there and, the people who have been watching it have basically been saying that it's kind of heart wrenching to watch, which is what I experienced when I saw one about 35, 40 years ago. Um, it happens several times a year. Um, and, uh, it, it depends on what causes it includes if it's fishing season, where the whale population is and everything else. Um, but it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to see, uh, but, uh, usually they can get taken care of. So it's good news. And hopefully the folks over there, in Unalaska. We'll have it free here shortly. Okay. Um, what do I, what do I want? What do I want to tell? Final story? Yeah, I got a couple, I got a couple minutes here. I got a couple minutes. Final story. This one from the Good News Network. An Australian bank representative recently yanked an unsuspecting woman back from the brink of financial oblivion that she was about to throw herself into, resulting from an internet scam. No, tell me there's no scams on the internet. West Pass, uh, Westpac Bank trains its employees to poke questions at anyone engaged in strange transactions. And this teller's suspicions were aroused and she was proven right every step of the way. Um, it's an example, according to the Fraud and Financial Crimes Division of the bank, about how valuable person-to-person -person interaction in private banking uh, can be. Um, as report as part of the in regards to the scam, the Tari, uh, the teller Mar Mariana um, noticed a woman in her seventies who seemed nervous coming to the news that she was going to sell her home, and then she wished to cancel the home insurance she had through Westpac. Uh, asking why she was planning to sell, uh, the teller got an unsatisfactory answer from the woman uh, that the woman needed help to help her son. Inviting the woman into a personal office, she dug a little deeper and found out the reason the woman was going to make one of the largest financial decisions of her life was that she needed to free her boyfriend from an overseas prison. <laughs> she says, my next question was, please tell me the last time he took you out for coffee. And she said, actually, never. We met online. It didn't take long for the teller, whose very father was scammed out of millions in a similar routine then decided to run a reverse image search on Google for the man that claimed to be her boyfriend and discovered that many photos the client received from the man were online, but with different names. And uh, the internet scamming was stopped. Uh, apparently, they, uh, I mean, it's just, it's that's just some good, people looking out for people. Doesn't that, you know, and, you know, there's a special place in hell for people who scam folks like that. I just got to say, there are a few things that raise my blood like that. People who prey on children and the elderly are at the top of the list, and they all get the lead pill, as far as I'm concerned. Every one of them, that should be, that's not a prison sentence. That should be death penalty case right there with no, with no appeals. You prey on children or the elderly in that way, and uh, I'm sorry, you deserve to burn. Uh, maybe that. Maybe we should stop with the. Maybe it shouldn't be the firing squad. Maybe it should be the flamethrower patrol or something. Anyway, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's. Um, you could tell what kind of mood I'm in today, huh? All right, let's uh, continue. We got more to talk about. Um, but I'm counting on you as well. We could talk about non-political things. I mean, that doesn't hurt my feelings. I'd love to hear what you have to say. The Michael Duke Show. Common sense, liberty-based, free thinking radio.
listened to by more staffers in Juno than any other show. Because their bosses told them to. And after what they just heard, oh man, they're going to be pissed. You're a bad, bad man. The Michael Duke Show. All right. <clears throat> um, wow, you wild and radical guy. Yeah, apparently. Somebody apparently doesn't want me rocking the boat. Because they've got a very delicate balance in there. Because they had to make a deal with the, with the rural caucus, the Bush caucus. They had to make a deal with them. And some of them in the Bush caucus are in no way, shape, or form <clears throat> conservative. So the Bush caucus got a deal and they got positions of power and leadership. And there's been a lot of ruffled feathers lately. Um, from what I'm seeing, C.J. McCormick has been throwing some serious tantrums about some stuff. And um, apparently we're just, you know, we're. We're just, we're causing some problems, causing some problems. Uh, and I, I have a feeling that their majority is a little shaky right now. So when somebody is asked not to appear on the show, then, uh, you know, by the majority, it wasn't shower. Shower's not on till next week. I get, get back up to speed here, Harold, pay attention. He is not going to be on till next week. We knew that last week. We knew he was off this week. So catch up. Catch up. Uh, kind of crazy that they won't come on the show because uh, they like uh, work for us. Mm, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Let's figure it out. Dr. Dirt, what is that about? Did I miss something there? I'm going back here to see if I missed something. Firecracker Thursday, says Chris. I don't know what that means, but sounds good. I mean, sounds good. No, no. Um, evidently, the people voting for LaFrance are not watching the assembly, said Rick. Well, um, yeah. Um. Okay. You, <laughs> Cindy says, you pray on the elderly or children. Say hello to my little friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. Melissa, you're not wrong. Um, all right. Whatever happened to Gabrielle Ledoux? Um, she's still facing, she's still facing those charges. They keep getting delayed and pushed off and everything else, but she's still facing those charges. Um, oh, doc, she's a dirt doctor. Liz Schneider had a PhD in soil science. Um, yeah, it just said she was an instructor at the U. I don't remember what her, I don't remember what her, uh, what her deal was. Um, uh, but it's a great stuff. And it just shows how people come up here and flirt around with Alaska. And then when they don't get their way, they leave, which is just so typical in that regard. So typical. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Where was I? I cleared that. We did that. I still got some other news. I want to talk about that. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to, trying to get all my ducks in a row here. Uh, what else, what else do you guys want to talk about? What else did you guys want to talk about? Anything that you'd like to discuss? I mean, should we do something what if related? Should we do, should we talk about favorite pastimes, TV shows, chicken recipes for Harold? Should we do chicken recipes? Oh man, my wife makes some great chicken recipes. Oof, so good. She makes this chicken salad. I just had some yesterday that is just, free. you take a rotisserie chicken, you know, and it just, it's so freaking amazing. So freaking amazing. And I know several people have asked for Brandy Hardy's clip, which we will probably play again, but I, I again, I'm waiting for it just a little bit because I get so agitated about it. I, I'm trying, trying to remain cross just trying to remain calm. Okay. 
And we got one line on hold now, but we don't have enough time to check for their name. So we'll just start fresh with them. How about that? We'll do that. Does that sound good? Good. And I'm glad you agree. I'm glad we're all in agreement. Put everybody in rocking chairs. Everybody agrees. Here we go. Jumping back into it. The Michael Duke Show. Public enema number one. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, enemy. Public enemy number one, which makes more sense. On the other hand, he's a little bit of a pain in the uh, Michael Duke show. All right. Well, let's continue. I didn't catch this. Somebody just said uh, in regards to my guest not showing up today, uh, Lisa or and Gary, uh, whichever one it is, Lisa or Gary. Uh, she's, uh, they said after yesterday's house meeting and legislature legislators disparaging, uh, disparaging each other, that might be why they don't want to come on. She spoke out about it. Just watch yesterday's house meeting. Um, I didn't catch yesterday's house meeting because I was busy working, which is the problem with this thing. Uh, anyway, um, you know, cause you're working and you can't pay attention all the time and I'm not going to spend all night watching the entire day's house meeting, uh, when I get home, uh, kind of thing. So uh, interesting. We'll see. We'll see. I'll see if I can look back at that. Thank you for the heads up. All right, let's go over to the phones and, uh, see what you have to say this morning. Uh, we're just kind of rummaging around, uh, talking about different stuff today and you can help drive the bus at uh, 433-3150. Over here. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Yeah, this is Mike from Los Angeles. Hello, Mike. What's uh, on your mind? Just note. Well, I put a note on your board this morning, and I, I did, maybe nobody saw it because it was early on, but every time they subsidize something, they subsidized that education, the price went up. They subsidized medical, the price went up. Now they want to subsidize child care. That's just going to shove the price of health care up in this state more than what it is now that i'm a little confused they would they want to help people but they're raising the prices on the people that for whatever reason are going to qualify for their little program and they're just creating a bigger problem and there's something was said about it being seven and a half million dollars uh you you look at the history of education and pharmaceuticals and medical that's where it started and it skyrocketed from there um is anybody thinking about this? Well, I mean, you, I haven't heard it mentioned anywhere. You, look, you're making a valid point. I mean, this is something that has gone on anytime the government has subsidized anything. It in the in the long run, it has ended up costing more. Why? Well, because it's subsidized. I mean, colleges and college tuition is the perfect example of this. You also mentioned medical and many other things. This has happened time and time and time again um, when you see this kind of stuff. And you're right. What is this going to do to the cost of child care in the long run now that it's going to be subsidized? Um, at one point, it was just going to be tax credits. Now it's cash payout, seven and a half million dollars in cash payouts as well. Why is it the government's job to provide child care to everyone? Um, and again, this goes back to what we were talking about yesterday with Andy Forsellis' comment about being tax slaves. It seems like this is part and parcel of the whole plan, that you become so entangled, they become so entangled in every aspect of your life through subsidies or payments, and then you owe them and you've got to pay them and do all, that you just become wrapped up in it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's an inevitability. And people, even people who are ostensibly conservatives, fiscal conservatives, get suckered into it because, oh, it, it helps. It's the good. We want, we don't want people to be hurt and we don't, I mean, this is life people. You can't be all things to all people. And that's what uh, I think happens, um, in these kind of instances, Mike. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm, I'm, I think we're on the same page. And while I got you on the phone, I, <clears throat> I wanted to mention something else. Uh, I used to work at job Corps. And a lot, there's a lot of native students down there, which is fine. I, you know, but one of them made the comment to me, one of the young ladies down there basically said, yeah, this is a vacation for me. And then when I go back to the village, I, I'll, I'll be getting pregnant every year or two so that I can come into Anchorage and get an abortion and then go shopping. And, and uh, you know, it's all in the state's dime. So uh, it, it's a good system that works for us. And I was, I was stunned. 
I was like, what? I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a plan. Work. That's how they actually, that she said, this is like a plan. Yeah. She said that that's well known throughout the villages that that does, they do that all the time. Well, that's, um, if that's, uh, you know, if that's true and if it, no, if that's true, that's a little heartbreaking. I mean, it, it is a little heartbreaking on, on several levels, but uh, predominantly for the people who would think that that was okay. That's 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 a little heartbreaking right there, uh, for sure. Um, I, all right, Mike. Well, thank I'm, you. I'm not I'm not arguing. At all. Yeah, I appreciate the call. Thank you uh, so much for calling in and joining us this morning. Uh, that leaves all uh, all the lines open. If you would like to call in this morning, 907-433-3150. Um, he's not wrong. Subsidizing something inevitably increases the cost. And again, the primary driver on this and the primary example that we can see uh, today is in college tuitions. Um, uh, now I'm curious. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, the increase in college tuition. Um, <clears throat> average cost of college tuition, the inflationary measure. Uh, let's see, there's a bunch of different uh, images here. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, this chart shows the average college tuition increase since 1980. Um that only goes up to 2015, but from 1980 to, to 2015, uh, college tuitions almost doubled. Um, average cost uh, in uh, from 2011 to 2020 uh, doubled there. <laughs> the average cost of tuition and fees uh, going all the way back to I mean, it just it just doubles it. Nineteen seventy two to nineteen seventeen, it went from six thousand to thirty five thousand dollars for the average college tuition. And part of this is, of course, that we've started to subsidize college educations and and college tuitions all the way around. I'm not saying that education is a bad thing. I'm saying that people, when they work for something, when they strive for it, when they struggle for it, it gives them. I mean, that's where I was at in college. I decided I didn't want to continue to attend college after I started. I started, I did one semester, and I said, you know, this is not what I wanted. Now, uh, and and I still have to pay for it. Um, and so there was an incentive. Now, if the government was paying for everything and all that kind of stuff, would I continue to coast on my free ride and do it? Maybe. I Well, probably not. But, I mean, the potential is there. This is the problem when you subsidize anything. And at what point did it become government's responsibility to take care of your children? That's a that's a personal thing right there. That's a personal thing that you should be. You, yeah, I mean, yeah. All right, let's. Um, Let's continue along here. We've got another phone call this morning to get things started. Uh, let's see if we can crank up the machine. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Michael, this is Carlene in Kodiak. And to add on to Mike's conversation, it's happening in Kodiak with the Coast Guard subsidizing housing. And uh, so it causes the locals to pay really high rent. An elderly native lady, her rent went up to $2,500 a month. And um, some rents that were $1,000 are now $3,000 for the same apartment. And then hotel rooms are incredibly high. And the bed and breakfast, there's, they start out at about $350 and upwards per person. So it just seems like um, the same topic Mike was talking about. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Carlene. I appreciate you sounding off this morning. Um, I could see a subsidy uh, for or a stipend for personnel who are living uh, or things like that, but it is going to have an effect on the local economy, uh, regardless of where the, where the stimulus, the stipend, the subsidy, whatever you want to call it, comes in, uh, especially if it's coming from the government. 
it's going to have an effect uh, on the local economy one way or the other. That's uh, that's that's the nature of the beast. Uh, let's go over here. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Randy in Fairbanks. Randy, what's on your mind? Well, since you were asking for people to call in to contribute a little bit, uh, I thought I'd just share some unimportant, boring news with you. Oh. <laughs> and And then that is simply that I finally got arrested a little bit. I'm getting tired of not getting a receipt from them in the last few years. So on, in my PS, I said, PS, last year I sent my uncashed 2022 PFD check, $3,284, back to the state and requested a receipt but never got one. <clears throat> so I have no idea if you, if you ever got it. This time I'm sending it to P.O. Box 110463 instead of P.O. Box one one zero four six two. I hope I have success in getting a receipt. Thank you. So that's my boring, unimportant news <laughs> for the day. Well, Randy, as always, while I vehemently disagree with your position on this, I still respect your tenacity in sticking to your guns and sending that money back. Unfortunately, you know, that money's not going to go into the CBR and none of that money goes back into the CBR. It just goes right back into the general fund uh, or the earnings reserve, I guess, uh, depending on where they put it. But um, it's good to see you sticking to your gun, sir. I mean, I wish there were more people like you who would stick to, even if they're wrong, would stick to their uh, principles on that. Thank you for sharing that with us today, Randy. I appreciate it. Um, I mean, again, the guy always puts his money where his mouth is. I don't always agree with him, um, but <clears throat> he is not afraid to spend his own hard-earned cash to uh, to support what he believes, which if more of us did, would maybe make a bigger difference in the long run. All right, let's go over here. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Yeah, this is Alexander and Homer. And, you know, it's it's funny. You, you mentioned the education system and some of the shortcomings as far as funding. And one thing that really sticks out to me, so I'm 32 years old. Mm -hmm. My brother and I just took over our father's mechanic business in Homer. Uh, he passed away here a few months ago. And the one thing that really gets me is that all the vocational programs have gone out of high school in the state. And if you look at the per capita employment professions of young men and women in the state, we, uh, vocationally, we are, it's the most demanding place to live. And we spend a whole lot more money on, oh God, the state budget. I, who knows? But we've gotten rid of vocational education in a state that primarily our economy provides raw natural resources. And as a state trying to be successful and trying to, you know, you hear about the budget deficit in Juneau all the time and how, how we don't have money to spend and yet we can spend millions and millions of dollars on roads, we aren't creating a, a capable next generation to actually solve the problems that we have and actually provide the resources that we need to advance the state. And, you know, and as a young guy, I was homeschooled third through eighth. And when I got to high school, there was very little vocational education. Yeah. Fortunately, I grew up with that provided through my family. And I would think that anybody on the education board in the state who realizes how it operates, that vocation and teaching people to actually have real world skills that involve using their hands would be a lot more important than just bouncing budgeting and funding around to figure out which swimming pool is closed, like the one in Homer. It, it yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's kind of crazy to me, man. Uh, you know, I'm 32 well, years old, but I, I never imagined that I would be this age and have a more clear view on what we're doing wrong than the people who supposedly are experts on it. I, you know what? I would not disagree. I mean, there's been this huge focus over the last 15 or 20 years on STEM, science, technology, 
um, uh, English and math. I get no what engineering and math, STEM. That's the thing, which is important stuff. Well, Don't, what about what about yeah. reading, writing, and arithmetic? Well, no, I mean, what I, about what about learning how to? Right. Let me finish my thought because I agree with you. STEM is important. I mean, I agree that STEM is important, but what about, like you said, the trades? You know, shop class, wood shop, and auto mechanics. And things like, look at where we're missing, look at where there are big ga gaping holes in the employment sectors. Uh, you know, they're looking for welders, they're looking for truck drivers, they're looking for uh, certified or, or experienced mechanics, auto, diesel, tech mechanics, uh, AP, you know, airframe and power plant stuff. Oh, no, uh, no, uh, no, Mike, Mike. Mike, as, as a business owner, as a mechanic, I, I try to provide my customers with a high quality product. I can't find good help to hire. It isn't even out there anymore. Yeah. If you find a good guy, he's probably already employed by somebody else or has his own thing going on. And that really is the essence of the problem. It doesn't matter what fancy degrees you have. Learn how to read. Learn how to articulate yourself. Learn how to balance a checkbook and learn a skill that involves your hands. Because when the people with their hands who work with them, who understand how the world works, when they stop, the world stops turning. Yeah. And, well, and I think not just as a state, but as a country, we've lost sight of that. Yeah, I agree. It's not about people who have fancy degrees. I, I agree. I mean, that's what Mike... hand on something. Yeah, that's what Mike Rose thing has been all about this whole time, is these dirty jobs, right, what they considered, what, what society looked down on as dirty jobs, is what keeps society moving. And if we don't keep doing that, and if there's not people out there that are educated or in, encouraged to go to the jobs that they want and 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 do these things, work with their hands, carpenters, mechanics, and and that you know society would grind to a halt. And and yet they, I've always thought you know it's rough. To, I never looked down on a plumber. That's not a job that I want to do. It's hard work. It takes a lot of experience, uh, but it's super important when I want to flush my toilet. You know what I mean? And so you're a hundred, you're a hundred percent right. On well, that. as, as, it, as Ayn Rand put it, when the people like that stop yep. participating, stop helping the motor that turns the world stop. Yep, exactly. All right. We're out of time. Thank you for your call, folks. We got to go. Uh, Michael Duke show continues right after this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted Mike to uh, let, let me let me finish up here. Uh, know how to. I'm sorry. I had to. Along in a classroom. I had to cut you down for just a second because I was up against a hard break. So I'll let you finish your final thought here before I let you go because I was I literally had to push the button or we were going to be in trouble. So go ahead and finish your thought. You no, know, as a young guy who doesn't have a family, I'd much rather when I have kids teach them to be capable of taking care of themselves and having some useful skills than learning how to just get along in society and be part of these social inclusion programs, which is what education seems to be turning into. Yeah, thank no, you very yeah. much for keeping me on. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, thank you for calling in and, and sharing your thoughts. And I agree with you. I mean, I've worked I worked in the automotive industry for about ten years, and so I, I feel your pain because I was seeing that twenty years ago. I was seeing that kind of that lack of skilled labor, and like you said. Um, if somebody had somebody, they were either there or they were working for somebody else. And you had to keep people on that were not necessarily ideal employees because they were skilled at what they did and you didn't have much of another choice. You know what I mean? You you had to put up with guys going on a two-day well, bender and disappearing. We've no, we, we've, de we've de incentivized the desire for achievement. Uh, that's what That's what our public education system has done. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's part of that whole thing about the um, the 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 diminishment of masculinity in the market and some other things. There's there's a lot of stuff wrapped up in this whole thought right here. Um, and you're you're not wrong, my friend. You are oh, not wrong. Me. I I I wouldn't I wouldn't fit in the average social setting. Yeah, no, me well, me either. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so hey, much. Thank you very much for your show, Mike. Appreciate, Have a good morning. Appreciate your call. Uh, let's go over. We've got one more call, and I want to get them set up for the return to radio. They're going to be our first call right out of the gate. Let me go over there right now. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Mike. 
Jeff from Homer sitting in Maine in the blizzard. Okay, <laughs> okay, Jeff. Will you hold the line, my friend? You're going to be number one in the queue. We're going to start with you. Uh, apparently, Rick just told me that it's now snowing here as well. I haven't looked out. It was not snowing earlier, but, um, you know, there you go. Um. Daniel says, the mechanics are out there. Plenty of us out here working with our hands just got to pay up to get them. The oil fields and mines are paying more and more every day. And that's good. Your service is in demand. And that is fantastic. Um, so good for you, Daniel. I know that there are some good ones out there. But I know overall that there's not enough to fill the demand. That's part of the problem. And because um and because uh they are in demand that means you guys are getting paid more and more and more and uh it's good um <clears throat> so there you go uh genie says most auto shops won't hire women either um some won't some will i've worked at shops i worked at shops that had hired women that worked uh and were mechanics uh, they were few and far between. Not a lot of women have an interest in that. But uh, the auto shop that I worked at when I was much, much younger and ran the service counter for and did all that, it was owned by a woman. And so she had no problem hiring women um, who were out there. It, it, I mean, it is. It, 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 it can happen. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Um, um what was this richard said i retired out of a telecom career after 30 years in the lower 48 back in 21 moved here full time applied at acs and a couple other places and they essentially laughed at me with 30 years of experience installing and repairing high speed internet phone lines and other fiber optic internet they offered a wage that i could make at mcdonald's now i look after old people for one third of what i was making which sucks but a sad reality because some of these employers are douchey i mean there's a there's that <clears throat> they're looking for the lowest common denominator. They do not want to, you know, a lot of times they just don't want to pay. They just don't want to pay. Um, Melissa says, I have a 21 year old son who's built houses with a local construction company and has rebuilt his truck. He knows how to diagnose mechanical objects and he's smart. He applied at 20 plus jobs and one called back. He's now weighing and shipping core samples for Pogo bored out of his mind. Um, again, maybe now is the time to start thinking about doing your own thing. <clears throat> Little entrepreneurship. If nobody else will hire you, maybe you, and there's a demand for something that you do. Maybe you go out and do that. Um, or maybe you do the job that you're bored out of your mind on. As I told my son, he was at, we were having this conversation a, a year or two ago about him. He's like, I'm bored. I was, I'm like, well, side hustle. That's, I always had a side hustle, always. Uh, on top of this show being a side hustle, I had another side hustle on top of that. So what are you going to do, you know, and, and what are you going to do? Uh, all right, we're going to jump back into it. Here we go. Jeff is on the line. Um, it's, uh, it's time to uh, jump back into it. We will continue the Michael Duke show, common sense, liberty-based, free thinking radio. We're returning to the radio although it looks like we stuck with the radio on the peninsula. Hi, peninsula folks. Uh, we'll jump in right now. Public enema number one. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, enemy. Public enemy number one, which makes more sense. On the other hand, he's a little bit of a pain in the uh, Michael Duke show. And welcome back. <clears throat> we, re we cut it a little too short on the last time. It said I had four seconds, but apparently four seconds was not enough. So we stuck with the, the peninsula stuck with us on the commercial break. I hope you guys got a chance to see the behind the scenes of what it's like over here. We just chat and talk and do things and everything else. Folks in Fairbanks, you didn't, you didn't have to worry about that. You went, you, you got your commercials. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue here. We got a phone line on hold. Jeff from Homer, who's actually in Maine. I know that's confusing. Uh, but he's down there in Maine getting things squared away so he can return to Homer. He says he's in a blizzard, and he had thoughts today. Jeff, what's on your mind? Well, 
I can tell you, you you're, you're hitting the right nerves there. I can listen to you talk. Um, I grew up learning everything I could. I hated high school and all the school that I took because they weren't teaching me enough. You know, I try to learn everything I can because you need skills, skills, skills. And that's what I taught my kids. I have three kids here, grandkids. They're all doing great, but they have skills. They were working right out of high school, right out of right out of the vocational school, one of them, and another one out of college. But they have skills, many skills. And they have the skills I taught them. And I think it's up to the parents to learn skills to teach their kids, which I did. And I told my kids, if you were in a bicycle, I'll never take it away from you. I don't care what you do. If you learn a, a motorbike, you know, whatever. And everybody's you're making spoiled rotten brat kids out of them. No, they were too busy working for the next thing, and they grew up fast. Doesn't hurt them a bit. Matter of fact, they can learn more before they get out of high school than they can after high school sometimes because, you know, when they get that 18, 16 to 18, they, they know everything anyways. But, um, you know, but I got through that with them, you know, and pretty much these kids around here, I used to get from people, oh, don't you believe in child labor laws, Jeff? I mean, I believe that will be working. And now those same people tell me those are the best kids around. Those kids work. They're in their 30s now, okay? I'm 65, right? and it didn't hurt them a bit, but I didn't tell them they had to do anything that I did. They did their own things, so they have other skills that I don't even have, but they learned how to get skills and how to work through me. I was the one that taught them that. They looked up to me, and that's what I had to do, and I tell parents today, every one of them, get those kids working. You know, right in Homer, one of my guys there that I was doing his bed and breakfast for him, he had two daughters, and he didn't know what to do with them. And I said, well, put them clean in the place. Why are you hiring somebody? So they did. And they actually saved enough money to take him to Hawaii, man. So, you know, this is how it goes. And he thanked me. He said, wow. And I said, it is your duty to take care of those kids and teach your kids. Right, right. How to work. Give them a work ethic. That's what you do. Well, it, they like cars, you hate cars. Yeah, you're not doing. I had to learn cars. Yeah, you're not doing. You're not doing your kids any good if you're. If you're, you know, a lot of parents like want to shelter the kids from everything. You know, we want to protect our kids. We and you've sheltered them from things like hard work. I mean, I still remember when my daughter was uh, work. She went to work for a, a little cafe in Fairbanks. Our friends own the cafe. She got a job there and she was my daughter's a hard work. I, I've never been afraid of hard work. If I taught my kids anything, it's the it's it's uh, I have a pretty I have a pretty decent work ethic. And they knew that and they they followed that that example pretty hard. And she said she made it, it with short order. She was one of the managers of this cafe. And she said she had a girl that came in that was a year younger than she was. And she came to me that night and she's like, dad, I had to teach this girl how to use a broom. She didn't know how to sweep. She didn't know how to use to sweep and use a mop for cleanup at the end of the day. I mean, who doesn't teach their 18 year old? I mean, who doesn't know how to run? It happens. They're just not teaching them to do anything, uh, you know, outside of their, oh, they, they're in school and they're in all their sports and that's all great. Great. You've taught them some things there, but have you taught them skills to live life outside of that? And you're a hundred percent right, Jeff. That's the ethic. That's the thing that they need to, that they need to uh, learn. That's exactly right. And, you know, I, I had great teachers. I did have some great teachers because they knew, they all, they all told me it's, at uh, 10, 12 years old, I was born 50 years old. I was doing stuff that, you know, I was flying airplanes at 13, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, doing all this stuff. But not everybody has those abilities. But you have some ability. You have some likes. There's something in there that you can do in the society. And, and you're, you're hitting the right nerve because we need the workers and we need entrepreneurial workers that can go out on their own, you know, by their 20s and 30s or whenever they can. Because now... You, could, you can make your own wage. You can set your own wage. And once you get into that, I want all these young people that are listening and people that are listening. Now, the economy goes bad, like Bidenomics, let's say, and it costs, uh, oh, $50 a bag, you know, the hundreds, the new 20. You can bring your wage up because you are the best in town. Strive for that. Yeah. Learn everything you can. What did I do through COVID? Stood on the bed. The, the deck of the time bandit and worked with Neil Hillstrand, all right, and said, no, I'm not locking down. I'm not going to do that. We love our germs, all right? We stood up. 
And that's what makes America great right there. The people that we raise as we get well, older, <clears throat> see them in society, standing up for their rights is something we need desperately yeah. in this country. And I've been teaching it everywhere I go. Yeah. Well, and I would agree with you. They look at you like, look what he did. Yeah, no, I would agree with you, Jeff. And, yeah. you know, the problem is, of course, we've got governmental intervention. I mentioned earlier to one of the commenters who said her kid is very, uh, very skilled in a variety of things, but is having a hard time getting a job that pays, uh, you know, pays well or does. And I said, well, now's the time to start looking for, you know, maybe creating a new business or whatever. But then Frank made the, makes the comment in the chat room that I believe is also part of the problem. He says, what, start a new business? Then you'll find out how at every level of government they'll have their hand out wanting a piece of the business. And he's not wrong. That's the thing. Entrepreneurship, which is what created exactly. this country is being stifled by government and child labor laws, Mike mentions, stop many youth from getting a job. I mean, I understand you didn't want kids working in a factory at 12 years old, but stopping them from just going out and getting a job for a few hours a week, um, it, you know, there's there's a lot of problems in there. And, and again, that's governmental intervention trying to do good and instead screwing things up. Down to the last minute here, Jeff, final thoughts. Let me tell you how I solved that with Paula Page, what he was in. We had some kids that, same thing, they couldn't even work at their own mother's store because they couldn't get a work permit because it went through the superintendents here in, in Maine. And you know what? We busted that because I told them, I went in and I testified in front of all of them. I said, I'll tell you what, if you don't take this 12, 14 year old kid and put him to work now, the drug dealers will in another year or two, okay? As soon as he's driving a car or he's use, useful, they will put him to work. What do you want to do? I yeah. God, they put them to work. Yeah. Right. So what you need to do is everybody needs to get together and stand up for the politicians because there's more of you than there are of them, and you can stop a lot of that stuff. Yeah. But you have to go through the channels and see what they're doing and fight it. But if you just Je let them do it, you complain about it. You're not solving the problem. You want to be part of the problem, or you want to be part of the solution. That's Thank you. you pick. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate you calling in. I can't uh, wait for you to get back to the uh, to your old hometown of Homer. Thank you for calling in this morning. All right, that brings us to the end of hour one. We got more stuff to talk about next hour. Hour two, dead ahead. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. We'll see you then. No donuts for me this morning. I missed the commercial break in the last. I, I, they said I had five seconds. I was like desperately trying to get him to stop talking so that I could just mash the button. Um, but <clears throat> apparently it was, it didn't. Apparently that was, no, it didn't work. Oh, well. Okay. Um, grow up on a farm and talk to that kid about work hours. I know. I know. I mean, but, you know, if you're officially employing kids, it's a whole different thing. They're only allowed to work. I mean, I can't remember that I've got the placard up at the station that says, you know, how many hours teenagers are allowed to work and all that. You know, we've. <laughs> anyway, it's just it's just crazy. Um, you can't gain experience without being given the chance, making mistakes and having drive. You're right, Ryan, a hundred percent right. <clears throat> and that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is that studies are showing that kids, especially males are not engaging with the stuff around them anymore. They don't have that drive that they used to have. Um, and Frank, uh, I think, uh, Frank's Frank's banks, Frank, I, get, I don't know if it's Frank, but anyway, Frank keeps saying it's he says he nails it, too. It's much easier to have direct deposit from the government and don't have to know how to use a broom. It's a dependency state. They're making us tax slaves and it's a dependency state. Um, and then Jeannie says video game. Jeannie, there's nothing wrong with video games. I'm all my kids play video games. They've all played. We, I played them with them. We played video games for years that never stopped my work ethic. Now, again, what it is, is parenting. If you didn't, if you didn't require them to do other things on top of the video games, then it's, it's really not video games. It's just a failure of parenting. That's the problem. 
video games are like anything else. Uh, you know, that's that's the problem. <clears throat> um, my 14 year old son is looking for a job. He keeps getting turned down because he's too young for most places. Yeah. You know, that's why it pays to know your neighbors and small business owners. And if you can find somebody that'll hire him for a few hours a week to, you know, organize the shelves or clean up or do inventory or shovel the shovel, the sidewalk or whatever, you're lucky. You're lucky. Um, <clears throat> five seconds must be an eternity and read five seconds goes very fast. You don't, you have no idea how fast five seconds can go. <laughs> especially if somebody else is talking and you're trying to get them to stop for just a minute. Um, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, parents use video games as babysitters. Exactly. It goes back to what I was just saying, a failure of parenting. There's nothing inherently wrong with video games. There's nothing inherently wrong with movies or TV or music or anything. But if you are not imposing your, you know, if you're not imposing that discipline on your children of showing them a good work ethic and, and instilling in them the, the drive to do that, that's a problem. Uh, everybody that ever gained skills or experience did so because someone along the way gave them an opportunity to do so. The government doesn't want anyone to be successful, whether it be opening a business or a career, because then there is no need for them to interfere in your life. Tax slaves. That's it. You know, that's, you know. The other thing that doesn't help, says Richard, is uh, having uh, these morons that try to demand McDonald's pay them a wage that aligns with highly skilled or in-demand jobs. That's the thing. You know, this this living wage they keep talking about. Those jobs were never meant to be a living wage job. They're supposed to be entry-level jobs. So you learn how to work and you, work, you learn how the workplace operates. And everything. It was never meant to be a living wage job. But. You know, I digress. Uh, all right, we got a couple minutes here. We got one line on hold. Let's figure out who's on the phone, and we'll come back to them here. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Just listening. I'm sorry. Oh, it's just Jeff. It's just sorry. Jeff. Oh, it's just Jeff listening. Okay. Jeff, you can continue to listen, um, or you could, you know. Thank you. You or you could use the app. I mean, Jeff, I know you're you're not your technology challenged, but you can always use the app. Don't forget that with your phone. Um, all right, let me put <clears throat> let me let me let me mark this as being Jeff so that I don't uh, so I don't accidentally pick uh, up his line again here. Uh, let me mark this as uh, Jeff is listening. All right, okay. All right, there we go. That sounds ominous. Jeff is listening. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, we'll just continue on here. Um, can we talk about the experience of Boeing? Um, what? Can we talk about the experience of Boeing? Flew on a max yesterday, zero airflow, plastic sticking out from the overhead emergency compartment. Landing sounded like the wheels were locked. Wow, you're not instilling confidence in me, Ryan. Not instilling confidence. Um, <clears throat> that uh, that's that's not that's not good. That's not good. Um, Mike says we had a truck that didn't run when I was 12. I tore the engine apart when all was said and done. The truck never ran again, but it sparked my interest in working on cars. So I learned about mechanics. Yeah. I mean, when I was young, I tore all kinds of things apart to my father's chagrin. I still remember the time he had an Akaya tape deck that wouldn't work. And so I took it all apart and he came home in the middle of it and was livid. Um, but I put it all back together. Still didn't work. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it, but I was, I reassembled the whole thing. Uh, it was, you couldn't tell it had ever been torn apart. I love it. Um, all right. We got to go. The Michael Duke show, Common Sense Radio. Let's do it. Hour two right now.
Whoa, buddy, put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. Welcome to the party, pal. The, the Michael Dukes Show. The greed and the entitlement is astounding to me. What more could you want from a low-budget radio program? This is a dumpster fire. That was just BS. It is time to get a new perspective. We know just what you need, and we've got just the cure. Open wide and prepare for a steaming hot cup of freedom. I just don't fathom it. The Michael Dukes Show. Streaming live across the world. Live around the world on the internet at MichaelDukesShow.com and across the state of Alaska on this your favorite radio station and or FM translator. Hello. Good morning. Are you ready for it? It's Thursday. Now, I was supposed to have a guest today, but um, they got uh, they got yoinked back in. Uh, they were asked not to appear on the show because apparently we stir the pot. We stir the pot. <laughs> um, it is, uh, it's apparently we, you know, the, the majority right now in the house is a little too fragile to let Michael Dukes at the legislators because <clears throat> he may tip something over and that's a problem. Uh, so anyway, so that means it's just you and me today. And we've been talking about some interesting things. A topic came up out of the blue, which was dealing more with, uh, you know, not teaching kids the work, the ethic of work and, uh, you know, giving them basic life skills and some other things. Um, and, uh, it, uh, it, it brought up some interesting points. Um, and I think that it is, uh, I think it's a great topic to have now that of course it's a, we can't paint with too broad a brush. There are some kids out there who have an excellent work ethic and understand how to do basic things like, you know, take care of themselves and balance their checkbook. And there are, there are exceptions to every rule for sure, but it is amazing how many kids out there don't have the, the, the drive, the wherewithal, or just even the basic knowledge of how to do some things and how, you know, working in the trades, working in, you know, Votech stuff is, is, it's been so looked down upon. I mean, Mike Rowe, again, talking about Mike Rowe and his Dirty Jobs franchise uh, that he did, uh, it was a way to try and show people that those dirty jobs, while they were, yes, in some cases they were dirty, but they were tough, but they were the jobs that kept the lights on, that kept things moving, that, you know, help people understand how things work. Um and in the, you know, in the, in the event of someday where we have a problem where, you know, society is not working quite the way that it should, or there's some kind of major natural disaster or a Carrington event or something else like that, how many people would know even some of the most basic issues of how to stay, how to stay alive, um, in this day and age, it's, it's astonishing to me. Um, I was actually reading some data, um, about, um, it was some, it was some predictive data on estimates for natural disasters, um, um, uh, uh, you know, and, or terrorist event or man-made, you know, kind of thing. And one of them was this blue ribbon panel that was commissioned, uh, by Congress, uh, post 9-11. Um, there was a, a congressional panel that was put together in 2001, 2002, and they did a, they did an analysis, a threat analysis against the United States. And, and they were saying that one of the most devastating things that could happen in the United States, uh, or against the United States was the threat of electromagnetic pulse detonation, uh, which would not damage the, you know, it's like. It's a detonation of a nuclear weapon in the high uh, atmosphere, essentially, and that that would create. They were concerned about it. This blue ribbon panel in that was put together by Congress said this is a dangerous thing, and we should talk about this because this is a problem. Uh, but what was really interesting about it um, is because not only could this be caused by bad actors, 
you know, uh, at the time they were very worried post nine 11, they were very worried about, um, Iraq and Iran, and they were worried about Scud missiles uh, that could be shipped off the coast of the U.S. and loaded with a nuclear weapon and detonated a couple hundred miles above the continent. And uh, they were all worried about that. But then they make this little footnote mention about these things could also happen with what they call a CME, coronal mass ejection, a Carrington event, uh, which is a it happens. It's a fluke thing that happens every, you know, couple hundred years or so where there's a mass coronal ejection. It's a solar flare, essentially a massive solar flare from the sun that encompasses the magnetosphere of the, of the earth. And that said, these things could happen if that went on as well. So it could be natural disaster. On top of, I mean, I was just like, oh. Anyway, they were doing estimates as far as death toll estimates of what, what this would cause, the cascade effect of what would happen here. And they... <laughs> It's disturbing, folks. It's some disturbing stuff. I will tell you that for nothing. Something like a 75% casualty rate in the country, and mostly because people who live in major metropolitan areas and cities have no idea how to live without all the amenities of society and how they just would have no idea how. I mean, most people think that food comes from the store in little plastic pink trays. They think that the meat, that's where the meat comes from. They have no idea about hunting, fishing, gathering. Now here in Alaska, we're obviously way ahead of that power curve. Most of us know how to do that. Uh, We know, you know, the basics of staying warm and doing what we need to do. And if we had to, we, you know, we we could do most of that. But it just reminds me when we start talking about these kids not understanding trades or working with their hands or troubleshooting, problem solving, all this kind of stuff, how we are really doing a disservice to all of these kids in the event that something disastrous happens in the future, you know, they looked, it's the government's job to take care of us. It's not our job to take care of us. If something goes wrong, where's the government? Where's FEMA? Where's the things to help us? You know, wh- what's what's going on? You know, there's no, we've got to grab ourselves by our bootstraps and make sure we pick ourselves up and take care of ourselves and take care of our community and our neighbors and and do all the things that we can do to pull together. No, it's where's the government? And why aren't they here to help us? Well, probably because they're struggling with the 9 million people in some major city and they could care less about the 600,000 people in Alaska. Right? I mean, let's face it. You know, Alaska has always been an afterthought. And so here we are on that. And this is another reason why we should be talking and teaching and training up our kids to be self-sufficient, to have drive, to understand the trades, to do, to have problem solving. And uh, Jeannie was poo-pooing uh, video games earlier. Um, and, I, and I know that's an easy thing to try and blame, that it's social media, it's video games, it's this or that. And I will say, no, this is a parenting problem. This, I mean, that because I mean, I played video games with all my kids, and all my kids have got a great work ethic and do things. But it's because it wasn't just the only thing that we did, it wasn't the only thing that we did with them. You know, there's a time for play and there's a time for work. And that's, you know, that's where we all get. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm glad that I live in Alaska. I'm glad I'll always live in Alaska. Um, but, it, uh, you know, it, uh, it is sad to see that, uh, it is sad to see that many kids, even in Alaska is a, um, you know, that have the same kind of problem where their parents are, I don't know if they're trying to shelter them from the, the shock of the world of being an adult and they want the kids to be kids. I mean, I always raised my kids to be adults. I didn't raise my kids to be kids. You know, we cut them some slack, but we're raising them to be adults. And we're expecting, we have adult expectations from kids, especially when they start to reach their early teens. I told all my kids, I expect you to act like adults. Even though you're 13 or 14, I still expect you to act like adults because that's the expectation of where you're going. And I want you to try and emulate that. And you understand that in those first, those three or four years of teen, you know, they're going to struggle with it. But if you don't have that expectation, what do you get? Millennials. That's what you get. Millennials. (laughs) Yeah. 
So it's, uh, you know, I, I, you know, that's the thing. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a frustrating thing. All right. Well, let's go over to the phones. I do have some other stories that I want to talk about. Uh, but, uh, I also opened up the phone lines and said, your calls reign supreme. So let's go over here. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Um, Michael, this is Carlene again. Good morning, Carlene. I'm reading a book called Disaster Preparedness for EMP Attacks and Solar Storms, written by a man that worked for NASA, Arthur T. Bradley. But he even talks about what to do for your car. Um, There's a solar flare or electromagnetic pulse. And then watching some of the kids today, there are some really good ones. The little newspaper boy reminds me of a little man and the mail delivery fellow. You know, just there are some really good ones out there. Um, they've been raised well, um, like which how you've taught your children. Thanks, Michael. Oh, I appreciate that. I mean, yeah, the the idea of uh, the idea of in disaster preparedness for an EMP attack is what you were just talking about from a NASA scientist. I, I should probably get that book. That sounds like an interesting read, but it's something that I have been concerned about, not from a terrorist standpoint, but from the fact that it is a natural disaster that could just occur. And while I don't stay up awake at night thinking about it, I do wonder one day if something like that happens, what would society look like? Because basically an electromagnetic pulse has the potential to fry anything with a circuit board. So anything that has a processor, a microprocessor or a circuit board. I mean, the last time there was a mass coronal, coronal mass ejection in the United States was in the uh, mid 1800s, late eight, mid, mid to late 1800s. Um, and it, literally set telegraph wires and telegraph stations on fire because the the magnetic pulse and the electricity traveled down the wires and burned everything up. I mean, it literally was a, that's the kind of problem you're talking about. So yeah, there are things you can do to help and harden and do all that kind of stuff, but it's a, it's a spooky thing, Carlene. It really is uh, it, for, you know, the, I, the basic premise of most of the preparedness on that kind of stuff is, Basically, be prepared to go back to the early 1900s with your technology, because that's all that's going to work. The rest of the stuff is not going to work. And uh, for the foreseeable future, until it can be repaired or replaced or rebuilt. And that means you have to build the tools and rebuild the tools that built the tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a it's a long, drawn out process. Uh, so thank you, Carlene. I appreciate it. It is a, it's a, you know, like I said, it's a sp kind of a spooky thing. And that's why they said when I was reading the estimates of casualty estimates and they said it's a 75%, um, 75% <clears throat> casualty rate by the time this, I mean, 75% of all population casualty rate, that's a problem. I mean, it's a, it'll be a struggle. <clears throat> Won't have to worry about global warming then, I guess. At that point, I guess that's the only bright side. The environmentalists will be happy. They won't have to worry about global warming anymore. Uh, all right. Well, let's go back here. I got some other stories I want to talk about, and we will return. Although I could talk about this, this Lost Ways Thursdays, right? I don't know. We'll see what the chat room says. We'll see if we can get a vote in the chat room. We'll be back with more of the Michael Duke Show. Broadcasting live through a series of tubes. Allowing all of these uh, entities to provide streaming stuff going on, on, the, on, the, on the, the internet. Well, it's kind of hard to explain. Sorry. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. Okay. <clears throat> went to break. We're all good. I hope we went to break. Uh, Sourdough's. Uh, why do you think the most popular game amongst kids is Minecraft? They yearn for the mines. All jokes aside, kids should be allowed to work at least a few hours a week. Bussers, dishwashers, cart pushers, all those jobs the adults think are beneath them. It would solve the problems with labor. I agree. The anxious generation. Yeah, Joel, the anxiety in this generation is astounding. It's absolutely astounding. 
And part of it, I think, is because they have been so sheltered from so many things, including a work ethic and the ability to problem solve. It's just. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, uh, your genie, uh, genie says, Carlene has a point exactly why I keep a couple of old square bodies around EMP proof. She's talking about old cars, old square bodies, old cars. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, because that's the, that's the stuff that would still run because it doesn't have circuit boards in it. It's not electro, you know, it's not electro, uh, uh, electronically driven, uh, per se. It's just electromechanical. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it'd be interesting, you know? Um, Harold says modern devices are shielded from the aliens. Well, they may be shielded from the aliens, but they're not shielded from a CME. So, I mean, you know. Good luck. This damn thing in your pocket would probably, you know, this phone here would probably explode. Uh, the amount of energy that's released by something like that. I mean, that you know, and this is, again, this was not just me saying it. This was a blue ribbon congressional panel that was put together and said this. And I'm reading this and I'm like, oh, 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 this is not, ow. <clears throat> Definitely not a... uh it's definitely not an uplifting read. Let's just put it that way. And you read through that thing. You're like, oh, that's a little gloom and doom. That's a little scary. That's a little depressing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Um, really, at a young age, parents should be introducing their children to hands-on things, basic life skills, Rather than what we have now, where they spend, send the kids off to college, spend three hundred thousand, and then wonder why Johnny can't find a job with his transgender interpretive dance professor degree. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think most of this again goes back to the parts of the parents. Um, when my grandkids came to Soldovia for the summer, they were young, but they started off walking dogs and doing some uh, ironing for people. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh, um, my bicycle is LED is a EMP proof, except for the LED headlamp. True. True. A bicycle could be an important resource one day, Randy. You just now, I mean, it's an important resource now, but it could be even more important down the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so should, I, I mean, do you guys want to keep talking about this EMP thing? I mean, I, you know, I just found it fascinating. Uh, I we don't necessarily need to consider to, uh, uh, we just don't need to keep talking about it. Uh, I have some other stories, including, uh, the story of Liz Schneider, what's going on in the Matsu borough, the tax revolt over property assessments. that has been going on around the state. We could talk about all those things, or we could, whatever you guys, you tell me what you want to want me to talk about. You jock boom said. My 19-year-old son is a mechanic for a local semi-shop last week. My 7-year-old son uh, asked to talk to the boss, marched up to him, shook his hand, and said he wanted a job. Um, my The boss asked what my little guy wanted to do. He pointed at a tractor as it drove past and said he wanted to drive a truck. So my 19-year-old son asked me to bring the little guy back in a week later, and they went for a drive in a tow truck. Tow truck. <laughs> Good for them. Good for them. That's also it right there. Um, what? Says James, no rep Jamie Allard told not to come on the show. By who? Majority cancel culture? I don't know. Couldn't say. I can only speculate. Not, I can only speculate. Um, all right. We got to go. Let's do it. The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show. Not your daddy. Wait, sorry, not your daddy? Ooh, not your daddy's talk radio. Huh. Whew, I was scared for a second. Thought we were going down. Here's Michael Dukes and the show. Okay, um, final couple segments of the show here for this morning. We're all alone, just you and me. Phone lines are open at 433-3150 if you'd like to call in. 
433-3150. Feel free to give us a ring this morning and, uh, um, you, you know, there you go. Um, we, we got off on a tangent this morning. <laughs> We got to fight. It's my fault. It's all my fault. I apologize. This is what I get in my downtime for reading stuff that is on my mind. And I brought it up and, uh, it's a, <laughs> it's a problem. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's go over to a couple stories that, uh, I found a little bit interesting today. I think the Matsu is actually moving in the right direction with less government oversight and invasiveness. The Matsu borough uh, is now decided that they will no longer be requiring a business license in the Matsu borough. They will no longer be required to purchase and display the borough license. It was repealed by the borough assembly in a unanimous vote last night. Um, and they're expecting the mayor, Edna DeVries, to, uh, uh, to sign it this week. It was first implemented back in 1995, and it carried a $100 fee, and a renewal uh, was required every two years. Um, businesses that paid for the license prior to the repeal vote will not receive a refund. Suckers. Um, the change does not affect local, like city, or state business licenses. Businesses operating in Alaska have to hold a state-issued license, which carries a $50 annual fee. And Palmer and Wasilla and Houston all carry a city-issued license, which costs $25 a year. So it's always government with its handout, asking for one more dollar, right? There are more than 10,000 people who currently hold borough business licenses. And uh, I just got to say, this is a good move. Because what was it giving you? What was, why? They started it in 1995 and they said, oh, we'll be used for economic development and all this other kind of, and it never did. According to the memo accompanying the proposal, um, data gathered from those registrations was not used for any economic development tasks for at least 20 years. <laughs> Income from the license fees function only as a business tax. They expect to lose about half a million dollars in annual income. That's how much the borough is making simply by saying you reside in the borough and you owe us and you have a business. So you owe us a tax, a business license fee. Um, now it's funny, uh, my corporation, uh, is actually was incorporated, incorporated in Fairbanks. And it, it, that's where it resides. Right. But I started having some of my mail forwarded here because it was easier to get my mail here. And I got a letter in the mail one day from the borough that said, Hey, you're doing business in the, you're doing business here. You need to buy a borough business license. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm doing business in Fairbanks. And so is it, so I just, I've ignored it the whole time. I'm like, I'm not paying your fee. That's a stupid, you know, <clears throat> Come and take it uh, is basically what I said. And look, I won in the end. I feel so good about it. My business was in Fairbanks. Just because I have the mail delivered here does not mean that my bit. Oh, man. So <clears throat> anyway, congratulations to Mayor DeVries and Borough Assembly member D. McKee uh, and Rob Yunt, who proposed this and sponsored it and got it removed. I mean, everything that we can claw back from government, I am all about that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, for all the people who live in the borough, all the businesses who are here in the borough, this is some good news. It's some good news. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a, yes, you're right. It was incorporated in Alaska. But for, anyway, always got to be the contrarian, you know. Always got to be a contrarian. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, that was a little piece of the good news. This is here's this is indicative of what's going on here in Alaska. Don't you love it when people come up here and they want to play politics and if they don't get their way, they leave. And in some cases, they get spanked on the way out. This is the story of former representative Liz Snyder. <laughs> I just, I just, I've got to laugh at this because it's, 
this is a, we see this so many times. People come up from the lower 48, bring their big city, big deal, progressive ideas up here. And then they can't get, you know, they can't get the traction or they can't get it done or they get bored with it. And then they decide to leave again. Former Rep. Liz Schneider, the Democratic instructor at the University of Alaska Anchorage, who represented East Anchorage for about one term, has now been sanctioned by APOC and given a fine of $3,600 for giving her husband some money left over from her campaign as a thank you gift after the campaign was over. <laughs> Okay. I mean, that, that blatantly illegal. I mean, you know, but okay. 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 Um, why did she thank Sam Snyder? What did she thank him for? For volunteering. If you're getting paid, you're not a volunteer. Just, I just want to point that out. The commission ruled that Snyder violated campaign laws by, one, giving a prohibited thank you gift of campaign funds to her spouse for volunteered for the campaign, two, failing to report the work that her spouse did as a debt to the campaign, and three, not timely dispersing campaign funds after the campaign. And But they only gave, you know, she gave her husband a personal, she gave her spouse $2,000 as a thank you gift. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the commission dismissed the allegation that Snyder failed to report campaign expenditures when incurred for her spouse's work. Um, and anyway, for the whole thing. So a little bit of history. This is what happened. During her campaign, she enlisted her husband to be her campaign treasurer. After the campaign ended, Sam Snyder then went on to set up his own company, to provide campaign reporting for other liberal groups. Well, because he did such a bang up job with hers. The amount of the gift reasonably covered the hours that Mr. Snyder worked on the campaign, although Mr. Snyder's exact number of hours and the rate he would have received as a paid treasurer is unclear. He estimated he worked about five to seven hours per week over the seven months that his wife was running for office. And uh, so, anyway, this was all brought. This is all brought to the APOC commission and they contacted Snyder about the violation, but would not file a complaint itself against her. So finally, the guy who brought it to them filed the complaint himself a year and a half later, but it was not finally closed until last month. So APOC was brought in the loop, but they wouldn't do, you know, <laughs> her financial finagling became an issue in 2020. She took the whole summer off in 2020 from her University of Alaska Anchorage job, charging the university for her time, calling it a sabbatical, and being paid by the state while she campaigned. Later, she kept her university job even while serving as a legislature, which is against state statutes that prohibit state employees from simultaneously serving as legislators. And then after serving for a year and a half, she lost interest, and they quickly and quietly sold their home in Anchorage and moved back to Florida, where she had come from originally. It's like they come up to Alaska. They didn't get to do the wild, wild west thing that they wanted to bring all the progressive values. And so what did they do? They moved back to Florida. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Oh, by the way, her husband is now listed as teaching journalism at the University of Florida. <laughs> of course. Of course he is. He's he's teaching. You know, the only thing the only thing better was that if he was there teaching ethics. Ethics. <laughs> ethics anyway i just i had to i had to chuckle at that one uh all right um let's uh let's let's go do a piece of good news before we go to break um just because we're all over the place today phone lines are still open if you want to sound off 433-3150 433-3150 an akita named hero lived up to his namesake he saved his owner's life last week in an incredible tale of loyalty and resilience uh, that saw him remain by his owner's side through two frigid Alberta, Canada nights, fend off coyotes, and eventually alert rescuers. Um, it uh, he they 
they started a GoFundMe to cover the vet bills uh, because he was uh, injured in the in the or the story. The whole thing began with an attack when a passerby named Curtis Dahl was walking in a field of mud and grass near a sugar factory in the town of Tabor. Um, and Hero came up and bit his dog around the neck. Dahl claims he tussled with Hero for 10 minutes trying to get him off his dog and needed stitches. Calling the police and animal services with a complaint, he alerted them to Hero's presence. But when the officers arrived, they saw Hero lying down exhausted near a terrace plot of grass and weeds near the road. And they suddenly heard a cry for help. They found a 61-year-old man on his back in the ditch, shivering and unable to move. He told police he'd been stuck there for two days while Hero protected him. Um, he was taken to the hospital. Hero was taken to the uh, Lost Paw Society, an animal shelter uh, that looks after dogs. Um, anyway, they, as it happens, the society's president said they had an employee who was the injured man's neighbor and knew that he had another Akita dog named Tora. So eventually, uh, anyway, the, long story short, the, the man whose dog was attacked by Hero was understanding and grateful uh, that Hero's owner was rescued. He received compensation for the cost of his dog and himself for uh, that $3,000 that was raised from the GoFundMe. And uh, so it was, a, but he's a hero. The dog, not only is he named Hero, he is himself. In fact, uh, this is why we love dogs, man. This is why we love dogs. Uh, uh, no word as to why the guy eventually fell into the ditch or had problems, but there you go. It was, uh, it's good news for today. You got to have good news every, every now and then. You got to have good. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, and Bill says he thought the good news was that Liz Snyder had moved back to Florida. But that's also good news. I mean, there's, you know, there's gradients of good news, Bill. There's gradients of of good news. That's what it's all about. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> I appreciate it. All right. Um, that's, uh, I guess that's it. We'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll do, we'll, we'll do it. Let's do the break. Come back. One final story talks about the tax revolt that's going on around the state. What's happening there. And, uh, we'll see what happens. All right. Back with more. The Michael Duke Show. Common sense, liberty based, free thinking radio. Running on 100% pure beard power. Oh, also some coffee we dip our beard in coffee ha, nice beard the michael duke show okay 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 um they come up here and they destroy our beautiful state says uh, alaska independence on youtube uh, he's talking about the the carpetbaggers that come up, like Liz Schneider, who come up here to bring their progressive ideals to Alaska, and then they leave, you know, sometime thereafter. Joel says, I love it when they leave. <laughs> I love it when they leave. That is the good news. Um, all right. Uh Where's the criminal legislator who had dead people vote? That was the Gabrielle Ledoux. We were just talking about that earlier today. Um, her court case is still pending. They're they're still jousting back and forth as to when, you know. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember when the, it's changed so many times. I can't even, uh, Riel Ledoux. Um, there we go. Um I can't even remember the last time that, uh, what, what it was, uh, moved to late July. There we go. Her voter misconduct trial, which started, I mean, this is for 2018 elections. It has now been moved to late July. It's delayed, it's been delayed three times so far. Uh, and it's four years after that she was pro she was uh, charged and arrested. Uh, you know the whole thing. Four years. It's been so. 
in July, Gabriel Ledoux will finally face the courts and we'll see what happens with them. So, uh, you know, um, <laughs> we need a national tax revolt says Alaska independence. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, Liz has become a shame on my family name. Joel, are you related to Liz some, somehow? <laughs> oh, the McKinney's and the Schneiders have been kin folks since the 1800s. Oh, that's too bad. That's too bad. Uh, uh, oh, Cindy, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, we'll keep her in our thoughts. Uh, she's, her daughter's having ankle surgery tomorrow. We'll keep thinking about it. Um, Poor jurors stuck on that crap during prime Alaska summer. I mean, yeah. Can you imagine? Um, Alaska's political system is so broken, it's not even funny. I mean, but you got to laugh at the same time. Um, <laughs> oh, you guys. Uh, you, you guys are crazy. All right. Um. Political courage is a lost art. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I am all caught up on everything that was going on. Uh, Sourdough Steel said, uh, my uncle lived handsomely in Valdez, simple shoveling off boats in the winter. He found a hole in the community needed and filled it. Made a ton of, mo ten ton of money simply shoveling. Yeah. Find a need, fill a need. I mean, that's the basic of what we've been talking about. But, I mean, if the kid can't run a broom, can they run a shovel? Can they problem solve it? Can they figure it out? That's just, it's crazy. It's crazy, crazy stuff. Um, okay. Mm, the whole tax cap thing that is in Fairbanks is a lot of people angry. $33 million for a puppy palace. Meanwhile... Schools are at an all-time low. Glad I'm homeschooling. Sad I still have to pay for it. Yes, yeah, true. I mean, they just closed Ileson, and there's all this weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth about closing Ileson. Yet they're going to spend thirty-three million dollars on a new on a new dog shelter. Thirty-three million. I mean, I know we're talking about separate budgets here, the school budget and the borough, but I mean, really? That you know, that's the that's the that's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, see if you don't count the Dukes won't call you out for name calling. You know, the thing is, is if you're not a troll, then I, you know, I see people just get upset with you because you're trolling them. You're, you're like, you're not even devil advocating. You're just being contrary to be contrarian. That's where you're at. It's, uh, you know, there you go. You get plenty of call outs on the show. You get, you get your attention that you need. It's there. Just there you go. Um, maybe we need to back off a bit on the one who bailed on Mike. They may not have decided to come on the, I mean, I haven't named names. I mean, you guys could figure it out. I just, I thought it was interesting that they said that they were asked not to appear, which would lead me to believe that it's the leadership that asked them not to appear. And it all, I think is because the, because the majority is a little sketchy right now. You know, I don't necessarily blame them personally, but, you know, um, I, yeah, I just, you know, politics, man, it, it, this world would be great if it weren't for all the people in it, right? People suck. <laughs> the politics sucks. I just, oh. The Michael Duke Show, not your daddy. Wait, sorry, not your daddy? Ooh, not your daddy's talk radio. <laughs> Whew, I was scared for a second. Thought we were going down. Here's Michael Dukes and the show. Okay, uh, one final segment. I saved the best for last. And I saved this one specifically because... It angers me. <laughs> I didn't want to spend 
I didn't want to spend the rest of the show agitated and uh, because, oh, man, yesterday I was so wrapped up about the non-reaction from the Fairbanks School Board over the comments of Brandy Hardy, which I, you know what? I said I would play it today. Uh, this is what Brandy Hardy had to say uh, about your legislators up in the interior and received zero consequences, even though there is still the threat of potential legal action in the air. And the school board issued a non-apology um, after the interior delegation asked for an apology. Uh, this is Brandy Hardy and what she had to say. To the other representatives, Representative Tomaszewski, Senator Myers, Representative Kronk, and I slightly give Representative Prax a pass because he didn't vote for it to begin with. So at least you stood by your vote. I am so utterly disappointed. Fairbanks deserved better. You are part of our community and we were clear what we needed and you let us all down. And I've heard rumors and mind you, they're rumors. So newspapers in the audience, <laughs> <laughs> I'm fully aware. <laughs> 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 Don't quote me on it. That you might have sold us down the river for a seventy thousand dollar campaign donation. I hope it was worth it. So uh, I'm just going to play that every day until the school board does something. And uh, you know, and uh, you know, like I said, if I was running against Brandy Hardy for any office, from dog catcher to state legislator, I'd be sound. I'd be clipping that out and playing that every day on my ads. Is this the kind of person you want going down to Juno and or going to your dog catcher or going to being a school board member? I would every any job she asked for, that would be every commercial would have that part of that soundbite in it. Because um, it's unconscionable. It's just unconscionable. Okay, I'm not going to talk about that today because I'm already going to get agitated by the next thing. And I don't have a lot of time. So Wynn Gruning, uh, who's a senior contributor over at Must Read, wrote this piece, which I thought was really good. Uh, we've talked about this a couple different times uh, from around the state. Several locations around the state have been having a problem with their assessors, borough assessors. I know in Fairbanks, there's been a whole thing going on right now that legislators are actually involved with, where the local assessor who changed has now decided to tax nonprofits. Um, if you have a nonprofit that, you know, 99% of the time deals with everything related to the nonprofit, and then you do one thing that allows, you know, somebody to use your facility or something like that, that doesn't apply, they're now putting them on the hook for all of their property taxes. And it's, it's a, it's a hot, hot mess. And that's happening up in the Fairbanks North Star Borough. It's also happening um, in part, as Chris Story was talking about, down in the Kenai Peninsula Borough. But Gruning is writing about a couple different bills right now, SB 242 and HB 347. They're each entitled an act relating to assessment of property, boards of equalization, and certification of assessors. It was introduced in the Senate by Senator Jesse Keel and later in the House by Rep. Julie Colomb. And they've gained bipartisan co-sponsors and several hearings. And the public testimony has been universally in favor of the passage, according to Gruning. Uh, basically, this legislation came about largely through the publication of a white paper on property tax assessment that was written by Haynes resident Brenda Josephson. It was called Restoring Public Trust. Uh, it was also co-written by Greg Adler, who is a property owner in Juneau and represents Goldstein Improvement Company. The dust up over the property taxes came to the forefront when a group of nearly 600 Residents in Haines signed a petition requesting that their borough assembly fire their property tax assessor, Michael Dahl. He was hired by Haines in December of 2022 after previously being let go from the city and borough of Juneau. The basis for the petitioner's complaint was excessive and unequal citywide tax assessments that failed to comply with the state statutes in calculating full and true value. Some of the property owners experienced assessed value increases of 50 to 100 percent or higher. They contended that Mr. Dahl was not a licensed appraiser, 
or a certified assessor. He instituted his own hybrid assessment system that relied heavily on cost replacement values without adjustments for market conditions or functional obsolescence. When the taxpayers questioned his methodology and attempted to appeal, they were often stonewalled or in some cases threatened with even higher retaliatory increases in their assessments. Oh, a bureaucrat abusing their power. If you question me, I will double the cost of your house. Um, under the current law, assessors are not required to explain their findings in reaching the true and full value. They're not obligated to physically survey a subject property or attempt to reach a settlement with its owner before a formal appeal. Even if the property owner provides an arm-length sales agreement or fee appraisal, the assessor can disregard it and exclude it as evidence. Oh, these guys are like, this is like the Stasi is running your property department. I mean, this is awesome, right? So the draft legislation attempts, it does a couple things. It requires that assessors be certified by the Alaska Association of Assessing Offers, uh, uh, Officers. Okay, great. Prevents property assessments from being raised out of cycle during an appeal. Composition of the Board of Equalization would default to an appointed board rather than elected officials. Requires the munis uh, to adopt formal assessment standards. And fee appraisals provided by appellants not accepted to full and true value would require the Board of Equalization to justify their findings as to why they turned down these appraisals that people paid for. The hiring of Dahl should have a red flag since she was he was involved in a similar controversy in Juno while employed there. I mean, did, did nobody do a background check on this and be like, oh, it's okay. During Dahl's tenure, Juno property owners experienced similar increases in property assessed value that resulted in hundreds, hundreds of appeals to be heard by the board by the uh, uh, the Juno Board of Equalization. Um, very few of those appeals were revolved in favor of the appellate and many dropped their appeals when told that their assessment, their assessments could increase. So if you pursue this against the government, it'd be a shame if your house was doubled in value, right? I mean, is this not the smoking gun of government? Shut up and sit down. It'd be a shame if we charged you even more for your primary place of living. It'd be a shame if you didn't just shut up and sit down and do what you're told and take your lumps. After some litigation, <laughs> Juno city officials agreed to pass an ordinance revising and clarifying appeal procedures. However, those revisions incorporate few of the changes contemplated in the state legislation and still leave property owners open to potential mistreatment. Haynes, for their part, good for them, officials, they fired Dahl when they realized the seriousness and the scope of the complaints leveled by the petitioners. Now, to this date, neither the city and borough of Juneau nor the Alaska Municipal League have sub publicly supported the... Good luck getting the Alaska Municipal League to AML... Is nothing but a it is nothing but a group of hanger on pro government toadies. I that I that that's pretty much it. Everything pro government, everything pro taxes, everything pro harvesting money from the people because that's what they're doing. They're harvesting money from you. How does it feel to live in the matrix? That's I mean that's what they're doing. You're here to be harvested. You're here to be harvested for your resources, your revenue, your money to promote their little whatever. Um, even though the testifiers are from, uh, even though most testifiers were from Juno and Haynes, this is a statewide issue that calls from Anchorage, Kenai, Homer, Seward, all of them with similar stories of unjustifiable assessment increases. Now, part of this, from what I'm understanding, is actually coming from a change in the state assessor's office where they've changed some of the mandates there and things the way they used to be done are now being done differently, all to the benefit of the governments because they need more money. 
more, M-O-A-R, more money. Needing to boost revenue, municipalities across the state levying property taxes are incentivized to maintain the highest assessed values possible. <laughs> this is a, folks, you are a resource for the government. You are a resource for them to harvest repeatedly. You are a renewable resource. You, each and every one of you, me, we're all a resource for them to harvest, for our properties, for our labor, for our profits, for anything that we do. We are a resource to be harvested and then spent on whatever programs they want, and they want to keep us that way. Right, Andy? You and him and me and everybody listening here, when we add up all our taxes over the course of a year, we work for the government more than we work for ourselves. It's not just income tax, it's sales tax, it's property tax, it's all this other shit. What does that make us? That makes us tax slaves in our own country that's supposed to be the freest country in the world. That, that has to change. I believe that the reason they make it that way is to financially oppress people for control reasons. You know, if people don't have financial resources and they're worried about making their ends meet, it's very difficult for them to concentrate on what's happening in Washington, D.C or what's happening in their local politics. So if you create enough division, enough hardship, enough confusion, enough anxiety, enough stress, it's really hard for the average person to get activated to pay attention to what's happening in the country, which gives them free reign to do whatever they want. Gives them free reign to do whatever they want because we're tax slaves at every level. I will remind you that the founders of this great nation, that the framers, that those patriots, sons of liberty, I will remind you that they threw a little revolution over a 3% tax on mail. A 3% tax on mail. They went and threw a bunch of tea in the harbor and kicked things off over that. Now you're working until August to pay for all the taxes and government at every level that you have. So you're essentially working seven or eight months a year for government, and you're living on the last four months of the year. Congratulations. Congratulations. You, my friends, are being reaped. You're being harvested by this government, by all governments at this point every level. And we've been so indoctrinated to believe that this is the right way because this is the way it's always been done. And if you start standing up and saying things like this, they're going, you're crazy, man. You're crazy. Yeah. Well, just keep writing that check to Uncle Sugar. Keep working till August. Jacob Sullum from Reason Magazine will be joining us tomorrow for Firearms Friday. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. Tim just said, we just work for the government until April 15th. That's the federal government for income taxes, Tim. If you look at the real numbers and you look at your income taxes, your property taxes, any sales taxes you may pay, plus the behind the scenes taxes on all the things you consume and the taxes you're paying that you don't see, you know, taxes on the loaf of bread, you know, which include the wheat and the labor and everything. We are working until like late July or early August to pay for all of those taxes. Yes, it used to be just till April 15th, but that's just the federal portion of the tax. And I'm not even sure that number is accurate anymore because it had been moving for years. But if you're working, even if you're working, even if you're working only for the first quarter of the year for the government, is that right? Does that make it okay? I mean, is that not insane? If you're having to work half a year to pay for all this government that everybody, what if you had all that money to begin? What if you had that money? What could you do with that money? What problems could you solve in your life that you wouldn't need to go to the government and ask them for help on? Right? Suck it up. We are being harvested. 
every single day. We've shed our terrestrial radio skin, and now we are slimy lizard internet people. It's the Michael Duke Show.
Thank you.